All right. Good evening, listeners. You're listening to Lament of Hope blog and podcast. I'm your host, Danielle Richardson. And today I am interviewing David Pate Co. Um, he is one of the actors in um, Flashpoint. It's a Canadian series. It came out about a decade ago, but it's a very compelling series. If you haven't watched it, it really focuses on kind of the daily life of being on a special force team and the types of lives that they intervene with and how those lives interfect you know affect theirs and it's just a very human show I very you know much encourage it my husband I loved it um and I still see it as very relevant now and I was actually just talking to David about it before we got on here but David you know before we start thanks for taking the time to be on the podcast well it's my pleasure thanks for asking so, you know, kind of, you know, to start out, I want to ask, because everyone's different. Did you want to be an actor when you started out? Did you think you'd be in the acting industry? Or was this just something that you ended up doing because your family did it before? Or Well, it's kind of the reverse. I was uh, always going to be a doctor because my dad is a doctor and my sister and my uncle. And, you know, so that was I've come from a medical family. Uh, but, uh, I don't know if you know this, but becoming a doctor is hard. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, when I, I went to college and I got a degree and I was kind of in between unsure of whether to, to take the leap or not. And I, uh, I did what I re recommend anyone to do if they have the luxury. I went traveling and I went backpacking for uh, almost a year oh, wow. and, uh, acting was always, something that I dabbled in, something that I studied a little bit at college, something that I did, you know, in high school. And I just, I, I actually remember the exact moment I um, had this kind of, you know, you, you, you hope you get a moment of clarity and then when it actually hits, you're almost like in shock that it did. But I, mm -hmm. I uh, had the moment of clarity. I'm like, I'm going to give it three years. And uh, I, had total peace about that. I'm like, I won't worry about anything. You know, I'm, I'm still young. I'll give it three years. And, uh, mm. you know, it's over 25 years later. What, what do you, how do you see it differently than when you started? Uh, well, the, for me, it's different because I mean, when I started, I don't want to say it was easier. I mean, it was easier for me. The The roles were, there was, when you're, uh, like, I, I, I look young and I played younger than I was. So I was, I could, I was, I was, you know, a college age playing high school students. And at the time, I mean, there were so many roles for that age range. I mean, you could die in any sort of film or scary movie or, you know, uh, there were, Let's put it this way. There's a lot more roles for that age range, especially when you're starting out. Like if you were a 40 something actor now who had never acted in film and television, you got to I mean, you're starting so far behind. But when you're in your 20s and everyone's coming, everyone's kind of coming into the business at the same time, the playing field's a lot uh, more level. Hmm. But the longer you stay in the game, the harder it gets because all your competition are successful as well, or they've done more or they're, you know, they're incredible. So uh, yeah, it's um, the longer you stay in the game, the harder it gets. Do you find it now because you're older? Are you shifting from acting to other kind of things? Because we were even talking beforehand, like more behind the scenes kind of work or. Yeah. Yeah. Which, um, you know, is, is just as hard. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Cause now I like it just to, to uh, prove my own point the other way, like, you know, trying to switch gears later in life to, you know, producing a show or trying to be behind the scenes or write or, or get something off the ground. Uh, that's also, it helps to have had a background in that from your early twenties and, and, and worked your way up through the kind of, minor leagues into the major leagues like a lot of people who are showrunners or who are writers have started off at low level positions and they've gained experience that way so if you're 
doing a lateral move, not a lateral move, but if you're switching, you know, uh, positions in the film industry after doing what I've done for 20 years, it, yeah, you're kind of, yes, you have a lot of experience as an actor and being on set and working with writers and producers, but it's uh, when you put on their hats, it's a whole another learning curve. Yeah. Do you, is there like a, a part you've played so far that you really connected with in a personal way? Um, well, you, I mean, all roles you try and connect with in a personal way. I mean, you know, I, you hear about some people who like, I, writers who are like, I wrote this role for you or whatever. Like I haven't had that experience where someone's, you know, done that, but, uh, you have to have a personal connection with whatever the role is. That's the job. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but I'm thinking that some stand out more than others. Well, I, I think what happens is, you know, it's a lot of it's the connection with the words. I mean, if you're have the luxury of doing a script or being in a show where it's incredibly well written, you're you become way more connected with it it's because it, it it you can't help it you know and if you're you might be having the time of your life on a movie of the week that's got no budget and the writing may be suspect and you may be having a blast and loving every moment of it but the you say the words and it's hard to connect to and no matter how hard you try in fact the harder you try sometimes the less connection you feel so um i think there is a definite correlation between connecting with a character and the quality of the the writing that goes along with it so for yeah. instance flash flashpoint was the perfect example it was the writing was so good uh, i just had to put on the uniform and say the words and i was there i was in yeah it was it was uh it, it didn't feel like work at all do you enjoy, like, I don't know from an actor's perspective, is it kind of relieving to be in a series for a while so that you have something stable you keep going back to and don't have to keep finding something else? Or are you also, while you're in the series, continuing to do other things at the same time? I mean, I think I can speak for most actors uh, who aren't movie stars that getting a series regular is the dream. It's, it's exactly what you want because yes, not only do you do you not have to worry about <laughs> auditioning for a while or chasing other roles, you get to sink your teeth into something. And mm -hmm. you also get to be a part of something with a group of people that become your family for however long you're lucky enough to be doing a show. Um, and I've been lucky to be in a few series. Um, the most successful of which was flashpoint. Um, and I never wanted any of them to stop. <laughs> like, there's no So, uh, but, you know, in hindsight, you don't want to get content. And I think I've made, I definitely have made this mistake in the past. And, and if I was to have the luxury and the privilege of, of being part of another series again, I think I would stay hungry uh, and, you know, make sure that when I get off that ride, I've got a ticket to another ride waiting because uh, yeah, that, that can, that's a harder thing to juggle is it's, and maybe that's, you know, what keeps, what separates some successful actors from, from other actors who are capable, but they don't hit that level of consistent success is that, is that ability that you mentioned to like keep your eye on, on the pri on other balls as well as when you're, you know, enjoying the, the uh, experience of one. But I, I feel like that that'd sense. be tiring, wouldn't it? I mean, when would you kind of rest? I guess you wouldn't then. You'd always be on. Well, that's a. I mean, it's such a. It's like life, right? I mean, you you uh, you want to savor the moment. You want to smell the roses, and you want to live in the now and not worry about what you just did or or what's a year down the road that's out of your control. Yeah. Uh, so when I say getting content is a, is a bad thing, I just mean it, you know, being content in life is great. I mean, you know, if you, if you can savor the day that you just had, 
no matter what's coming down the pipe or what just happened to you, I think it's, that's what you get. That's, that's uh, the secret sauce to life, right. Is, is, is yeah. being able to enjoy the moment. But when it comes to a career as an actor, um, getting content implies for me that you, you kind of think, Oh, this is the way it's going to be for a long time. Now I'm on this hit show. Uh, you get, you get all these, perks and you're getting paid well and you're living the dream and you think it's never going to stop and you have to not get content in that regard where you think you're going to be on the gravy train forever you got to keep fighting Mm -hmm. is there a character you'd like to play you know if you could pick any kind of character or a play and you really wish you could you could try it what what would you want to do well, it's too late for Hamlet, but uh, no, uh, uh, I think, you know, for me, like, I haven't worked enough where I'm like, going to be super specific about what I want to do. I think for me, like, I- I've always like, I've got a couple boxes I want to check off for sure. Um, a period piece, you know, swinging a sword or being on a Viking ship or you know, that's a, being on these sets that are just incredibly uh, cool because you're transported back in time. I haven't had like, that's an itch I really want to scratch. So whatever role mm-hmm. comes along with something like that, sign me up, you know, like uh, I remember, uh, you know, like, yeah, sure. I've done, you know, the lawyer, doctor, policeman thing a, a bunch, but I would never um, roll my eyes at a great role that was in the realm of things that I've already experienced. But uh, yeah, oh, sorry. No, no, no. I was, I was gonna say. Do you ever wish you had become a doctor still? <laughs> well, it was funny when I played one on TV. I called my dad and told him that I was a doctor. He thought that was funny, but uh, no, because um, I've seen what what that's like, and I, I mean. I um there's a lot of responsibility there that I don't know if I could um if I was cut out for. I I mean it's especially like you know my dad was a, a surgeon. So hmm. I think the um <laughs> I mean I think I could have you know gone into uh, you know maybe a family doctor would have been would have been more up my alley but just the uh let let me back let me back this up. I, I uh, had so much and have had so much fun acting, and I love it so much that I wouldn't trade it for almost anything. The, the experiences that I've had, the um, you know, creating something with other people and and laughing and having so much fun, and but there's still s- stressful moments, and you've still got to perform, you still got to hit your marks, you still got to drive that car, you know, eighty miles an hour down the street and stop it right on a dime. And you still have, and there's, you know, it's costing the production company $50,000 an hour to get this shot. Like, and you gotta, you know, you still have all these high pressure situations, Yeah, but it's not constant. And I think, you know, if you're a surgeon or if you're in whatever profession, that's, it's like every day you're doing that nine to five, you got that high pressure on you. I think, I think that would uh, that would be tough. I respect it a lot, but it would be tough. You know, you mentioned earlier about movie star versus actor. Do you ever have like moments of discontent, like when you really wish you could? Because I mean, there's the people everyone hears about. You know, like Scarlett Johansson or, um, oh, you know, Margot Robbie or Russ. You know, these big names, Hugh Jackman, all these people that you say it and everyone knows who you're talking about. And then, you know, you say something like, you know, just an an actor you've seen a film and people are like, I don't know who that is, you know, unless they've seen the movie. Um, Yeah. 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 Do you ever have like, how do you, cause in some ways I'm sure a lot of actors kind of have to come to this place of I'm going to be an actor, but I'm probably not going to be a movie star. You know, even if I want to be probably not going to happen. So how do you find 
contentment that without being, you know, envious of really wanting to get to that point, you know, where you're making so much money and you, you could decide what kind of movies you wanted to be in and all of this. Like, how do you mm -hmm. work with that tension? Well, it's, when you start, what do you, what, why are you entering acting? Because if you're entering it to be a movie star and be incredibly famous, you're probably going into it for the wrong reasons. And you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Miracles happen. And you, you know, uh, but I would say every one of those stars that you mentioned are super grateful for the breaks that they've gotten and they've made the most of them, which is fantastic. Um, but there's also the careful what you wish for kind of phenomenon. There's trade-offs to that amount of fame or that amount of, you know, uh, notoriety. I mean, there's some things that I do envy a lot though. And that's the luxury of choice. Like when I hear actors be like, yeah, I, you know, I, they sent me the script and I said no, or like I, I had this role, but I offered to me and I said no. That's like a, a level that I definitely have a little bit of envy and I have to, I have to work towards um, fight that a bit because that, I mean, that seems so luxurious at this point when you're a blue collar actor and you're auditioning still, or you've, you've had a run. Like I I've have had some offers back in the day when I was, you know, especially with flashpoint, but when you, you, when you stop getting them and you're, you're fighting your tooth and nail for the next role, it's a whole different, whole different level of, of, um, you you need such thick skin and you need to persevere because you know in the end that it, like we we call it getting at bats like you get these at bats you, you get these auditions you might hit a lot of foul balls you might strike out but every once in a while you're gonna get you're gonna hit a home run and that's kind of what you keeps you in the game and keeps you uh keeps you hungry keeps you humble and yeah. uh you you know and it makes you, um, yeah, it just, it just, I think it also makes you a better actor, which is kind of, I don't know if that's ironic, but uh, the, the less you work, the better you become. But uh, it makes you at least, a, uh, it gives you the full experience so that the next time you get a, a break and you create your own luck, you'll savor it and you'll, you'll enjoy it more than ever. Have you found it? hard to be an actor like you're mentioning you know having to audition so much and you know in a sense provide financially and have a family at the same time like has that added a new pressure to your life is that hard or yeah it's it definitely raises the stakes you know um and at the same time you know, the life that I, that I've provided for my kids and the fact that I have these three wonderful children in my life is because of acting. So, you know, if I didn't act, I wouldn't have these three kids. So there's, you know, I guess anyone could say that about their life, but that's the way it is. That's how I look at it. So it's gotten me this far. Um, and that the added, I wouldn't call it stress. It, it's just, yeah, you you would let's let's say you stop. You, how should I put this? Uh, you're definitely less picky when you've got to you know put food on the table. Yeah. Do you um, what do you find that you love about being a dad? Hmm. Well, I can't imagine not being a dad anymore so um but for me uh one of the luxuries of you know being self-employed and being your own boss and and um you know when you work it's great and you're super busy but then you know you're you're not you get a lot of time off in between is that 
I've been able to be so involved with their lives and um, I wouldn't trade that for anything. I mean, the fact that I haven't had to, you know, do consistently 90 hour work weeks, you know, 50 weeks of the year and like, and miss out on all these little moments with my kids. Um, I've been incredibly grateful for and taken advantage of. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it can change overnight where you're gone for three weeks or you're traveling or, or whatever, but the, 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 the bond is so strong that it's, it's, it's done, you know, like it's uh, if they would be my biggest fans, if I had to go for two months to film across the country, they would be my, they would be my biggest supporters. And our relationship is so grounded now and connected that uh, I wouldn't have that sense of missing out or yeah so it's it's nice Was, fatherhood is yeah go ahead but because it you're right there's these beautiful moments or fatherhood but I've always wondered like is there a moment as a dad when you're afraid of being a dad like you know you're a dad but then maybe it's a question your child asks you or a situation that mm. happens and then you're like man I like, I love being a dad, but I kind of wish I wasn't right now <laughs> in this moment. Like, have you ever yeah. had that? Yeah, I think so. But I, what I'm experiencing now uh, in my life, the parenting in two directions. So my parents are older now. And, you know, my mom passed recently and she needed a lot of help at the end. And the i i experienced it it's it's in um it's not that i was parenting my parents but i was taking care of them in the same kind of way in in parallel ways to taking care of young your own kids when they're uh, in failing health mental health and and you know alzheimers and then i i was also <laughs> my kids were also helping me look after in this instance, it's my, it was my mother. And I, I just found that that experience has made us all so grateful for the time that we have with each other, that being, there's no time to be scared or there's no point in being scared. Like, you know, yeah, sure. There might be uh, something scary in the news, or or something to to fear, or you know, an ice sheet melting in Antarctica. But all that is outside of what you can control, and what you yeah. can control is is the environment that you have with your kids, and you know, going back to living in the moment and being there with them. Sure, I'm worried about what what it's going to be like for them when they're in their late twenties and thirties and forties or whatever, but. I mean, that's, again, that's out of my control. I can only control what I can control now. And that's valuing the time that I have with them now. Yeah. And hoping they, they're they valuing. I mean, it's hard for kids to have that kind of wisdom, but I think um, trying to instill them with it is my job to, you know, don't worry about, you know, I have a daughter who's going into high school. Like, don't worry about how, enjoy the, the grade you're in now. Don't worry about call trying to get into college four years from now. Like, just just you know, enjoy, enjoy the moment, enjoy this beautiful spring day, and uh, yeah, we'll see where that gets us. Do you um, is there something particularly that you find hard not to worry about personally? Well, my worries are not so existential um there my worries are very um straightforward so i know the solution so if my worry is like okay um my worries are usually solved by getting a job <laughs> so my worry yeah. is the time when i don't have a job but i know see it's a different type of worry when you know the solution so maybe it's, it's more like a concern 
Yeah, it's a concern. I mean, you know, you can certainly have sleepless night and sleepless nights and and stresses and fears. And then there's also like, as an actor, like, have I stopped growing? Have I, am I rusty? Am I like, could I be doing more? Like, should I be taking more classes? Should I be going back to class? Should I be doing a play that takes me out of the TV world or the movie world? Should I, but then I've gotten kids. So, uh, you know, you, you do worry that, um are you it's it's like uh are you doing all that you can um yeah. and sometimes that's a concern for sure well you know i don't know the answer if you're doing all you can you mean yeah yeah you know it's interesting because your character in flashpoint i mean he goes through a lot of hard situations and has you know, hard relationships with family. Um, you know, what do you think's been, like for you personally, what's been maybe so far? Because, you know, you're not, you're older, but you're not like 80 where it's like, you know, I've got this long life to look yeah. back on. But what has been the hardest thing you've been through? Do you think you handled it well at the time or do you wish you did something different? Um. Yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, COVID was tough on, you know, COVID can be tough on a marriage, <laughs> so I'm still going through that, but uh, yeah, no, I, I for me, um, the most profound experience I had was losing a friend in my early 20s to suicide, and um, it was so shocking and came out of nowhere. And the sad part of it was that he had reached out a couple of days before, left me this long rambling voicemail and I didn't call him back. And I think I listened to it at two in the morning after I was in college and probably, you know, had a few drinks, just ignored it and just whatever he's rambling. And then two days later I found out he was gone. And so that kicked my ass and you blame yourself. You know, what, I, what could I have done? What should I have done? And all our friends, we were, we're a pretty tight group. We all, he reached out to a few of us and we all kind of, how are you, how are we to know? You know, it was, um, it wasn't explicit in his words. It wasn't in his actions. It just, you know, is it, it, it was just so, it was the last thing you expected. Sure. So, you know, getting through that, which, and, you know, I don't know how much, I mean, we've all got some experience with grief, but grief doesn't go away. You just kind of learn to live with it and it becomes a part of you and then you kind of grow around it. And, but you're all, it's always there. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that kind of, instilled in me uh, the idea of putting things in perspective. So when I'm feeling stressed or when I'm feeling scared or if I'm feeling insecure or anxious or whatever it is, I have an ability to kind of put things in perspective. Like I can think to myself, I don't know a bad example, but like, you know, it's, it's not exactly, we're not exactly storming nor the beaches of Normandy. Like, it's not exactly like you're, you, you can, what I'm going through in the grand scheme of things, it, you should be able to laugh at it because it's not, it's uh, you got to have the ability to laugh at yourself and laugh at your situation a little bit. I mean, it's, um, and the ability to kind of just just have a moment of clarity, look at it from objectively, and just be grateful that you're even having that experience, that yeah. you're here having that experience. You know, I mean, emotions are tricky. Like, I, I don't subscribe to the idea of like not feeling your emotions. Sure, it's just don't don't be paralyzed by them. 
So you should feel a little fear every once in a while. You should feel love a lot of the time. Happiness, of course, that should be the overriding number one. But doubt and envy and jealousy and anger and hate and whatever, you should you should experience those feelings. Just don't dwell in them. Don't sit in them. Don't let them puppeteer you, you know? And, and so that's uh, kind of the, the human experience. You got to feel it all because then it makes it richer. It's like the, like the name of your podcast, The Limits of Hope. You got to, you got to experience all the highs and lows to have a truly rich life. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with you there. And then I'm thinking to myself, that must be, hard though when you were saying to have this perspective of like seeing the big perspective of you know this isn't like a war or something like that which is true and that kind of does in some ways put in perspective but if you're going for a very painful situation I, I would I think that would be really hard to do because then it's like why does your pain matter you know what I mean I guess if you're looking at it the big perspective then it, it might just seem like it doesn't matter at all and which kind of goes back to your friend I mean it's why so many people mm. young people even you know they die it's like it doesn't really matter you know yeah I think I think the way I see that emotion is is that it, it's an opportunity to realize that you're sharing that emotion because other all the, the, the that is part of the human experience. So if you're feeling incredible sadness, you have to recognize that you're not alone in that sadness. Right. Okay. That this is part of the human experience. This sadness has created incredible works of art. This sadness has moved our civilization forward. Like this so it's not something that should defeat you ultimately. Right. I mean, I, you know, suicide to me is just is the not the answer obviously uh because there's so many things you can do even in the midst of all that sadness you can you can find the outs that are that are not permanent <laughs> and you can and i think by recognizing the common humanity of of those experiences i think it's really important well i was gonna and say not, too I, because you've experienced being on the other end of a suicide, so you kind of know the pain that people are left with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think also, like a lot of, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I would hate... It's not a selfless thing to do. You know, like, yeah, no, it's not True. giving up on your life is an attack on the other people in your life, whether you like it or not. You are so, but you have to have empathy for them because they've lost that perspective in that moment. You know, a lot of them, or they're doing it in spite, which is, oh, it's, you know, then you can't really stop that. But, um, Yeah, I mean, it, it's, that's why I hope, you know, that's why I think stuff like this should be talked about, should be talked about in, in ways that I think this stuff can be learned and taught, you know, how to deal with heavy emotions or how to have outlets for when you're feeling these things or safe places to, or spaces to, to talk about what you're going through and, and, um, I think for my friend, he just didn't want to bother anybody. Yeah. And he, he saw us all going to college and he felt like he was just kind of stuck at home. And like we were, but he, but he was, you know, he was 22. <laughs> I mean, like at 22, you just have, you're still a kid ultimately. So it's just, you know, the, the tragedy is the, the lack of perspective that he had in that moment, you know? 
did you you know because in flashpoint you dealt with a lot of suicidal people like in the story mm -hmm. was that triggering at all for you or or not really because you were in a movie and you knew it was like not really happening or um yeah well it, what was tr nothing was triggering in the sense of the, the way that's words being used but it was like really interesting that a lot of there's this whole thing suicide by cop so um our story dealt with that situation where the person who's in distress is kind of wanting it to end. Yeah. yeah. And the easiest way to do that is have the cop shoot you. So when the cop will say, don't raise your gun, don't raise, like put the gun down, put the gun down or, or drop it or whatever. They know that, okay, if I raise this gun, they, ha they have to, I mean, as a cop now you have, you can't, take that chance you you're trained you have to you have to shoot yeah um so that was shocking to me how much of that goes on um hmm. and, especially because you know, the cop would probably know why they were doing it yeah and then they have to live with that but you also can't take the chance that they shoot you i mean it's, right. sure. it's, such, it's such a it's such a yeah, damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of scenario. But um, yeah, that was, um, and that's, uh, you know, you, you hope that people have opportunities when they're growing up or in their life to learn how to deal and express big emotions and um, not everyone does unfortunately how do you do it with you know how do you process it because you said that you think about the big perspective is that for every emotion that you're feeling or like do you have an outlet that you you know go to when you're feeling a particular way um yeah i mean i i've got a few outlets i mean they're kind of boring i'm a big walker I don't know if you got got into the ten thousand steps, but uh, I found Walking during co, yeah, it's super meditative and it's calming. So I have the luxury of living right beside a huge forest, uh, an urban forest. I'm in a city, but uh, there's this, and it is incredible how just getting outside and walking and just letting your thoughts whatever they are let let them out let them do what they're doing and in 20 30 minutes it's gone uh, so whatever was nagging you whatever was pulling at you whatever was causing those doubts you kind of you deal with it you kind of process it as opposed to ignoring them or repressing them or dwelling on them constantly or um yeah, I heard I heard one piece of advice that was pretty good. Like when you worry, you're allowed to worry, right? You should be able to worry, worry about things, but give yourself the like, like give yourself 15 minutes to worry about, like, worry yeah. about it, yeah, and get it out so you're not thinking about it at three in the morning, staring at the ceiling, <laughs> like, like entertain the ideas, don't dwell on them, and don't let them, don't obsess over them, but feel them out, let them run their course, and and. You get to move on, hopefully. You know, you were mentioning that COVID was a particularly hard time. Was it hard for you because of no work? Or was it also just having to be inside so long? Because I know it's interesting because I know Canada, I have relatives who live in Canada. I know for them, like, it was very intense compared to the U.S. Like, people, like, in the U.S., you know, there were restrictions, but people could go outside. You know what I mean? And people mm -hmm. could... There were other countries that were definitely having it way harder than the U.S. during COVID in the sense of restrictions. So was it hard in that way or? Well, it was, it's kind of like the states where it, it probably varies by state, right? And in Canada, it varies by province. So out west in B.C., we had, we were, um, 
relatively uh, relaxed. We, I mean, we had to find socially, you know, we had to bubble and we had to, um, you know, for the, whatever that period was when everybody was doing it, the four or five months, um, <laughs> we were fortunate in that our spring was absolutely beautiful. So February, March, and April, where other parts of Canada, it's winter and you have to, you're, you're isolating at home and you can't go outside because it's freezing. And you you know, that to me sounds like a nightmare, but we had a really lucky, we had really nice weather. And so we kind of wrote out the hard part. Um, and, and I've, in terms of the act, acting, like the actual five, six months where the whole industry was shut down, uh, I thought that was great because that, then you didn't have that fear that you're missing out on something like, like everything shut down. So that's no, nobody's working. Yeah. That's true. So that's perfect. You know, like you're, you're not, you're not worried that you're not getting on something or you're, you know, it, it was so for those six months, just being able to be with my kids, they were pretty young at the time. It was uh yeah it was pretty it was pretty cool i was worried for them and you know what was going on with their school and all that kind of stuff but for me i i just took it as an opportunity to spend time with them i know you mentioned though a little i mean you don't have to you can tell me no i don't want to talk about that that's fine but you mentioned that marriage was hard with covid is it because you spend so much time with somebody and there's just a lot you're spending more time with them than you normally do because it's interesting you say that because I would talk to other people and they would say COVID is like, there were all these COVID babies, like people were just having a great, you know, they were reconnecting again. And some people are like, you know, I wish COVID would last a while longer, not because I want people to get sick, but because I love being able to connect with more with the people I love. Um, was that your experience or not really? Um, it was... There were it, it was like any point in a relationship. There were good things about it and ba and bad things about it. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I I think we got through it better. Uh, like, I'm glad we got through it together. Yeah. The, to yeah, you know, to the to the end of COVID, but um, yeah, it was it was you know it's tough. I yeah, it was, but no no like no tougher than anybody else. That's for sure. Yeah. Do you? I don't know. Has have you found that marriage has been what you thought it would be when you started out? Well, to, to be clear, I'm no longer married. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, it was it was a chapter that I yeah, I mean, I, I, like it's like a novel. I mean, like each chapter, what they they can be um, hard or they can be beautiful or there can be all these different chapters and you look back it all makes sense so when i look back it all makes sense yeah like just, the big uh, perspective you were talking about yeah 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 in the moments it's a whole different answer right um but uh yeah i'll uh i'm still processing all that stuff yeah i'm, I'm sorry that's hard oh well i mean it's been a couple of years now and the kids are great and we live uh really close to each other and the kids go back and forth and it's pretty uh progressive and modern family situation so uh, in terms of that it's great well you know i because i want to be respectful of your time i wanted to ask one more question you know what do you you know what does david want to see different about the world I know that, you know, you were mentioning that there's only so much we can do in our sphere and it's a healthy perspective. But at the same time, I know there's always things we wish were very different. So if you could change something about the world, what what's the first thing you would do? It could only be one thing, though. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, I, I would encourage, or I would hope that people not, not nothing mandated, but it would seem to me that the more you travel, the more you meet other people, the more you're exposed to other cultures, the more you try different foods, the more different music, the better you are. Like, you know, like not better as in like you're a better person, but like the more richer your life is and the more perspective you have back to perspective. So um, if I could uh, change anything, I would like every kid from 18 to 20 to have to travel around and meet other people and then go back to their homes, be exposed to different things. Because I think we're all uh, as much tribal and as crazy as things have gotten and the information silos and, you know, how all these almost alternate realities, uh, it's would be a lot easier for people to get along. And if they actually met the people, <laughs> That they don't yeah, get along understood with. understood them better. Yeah. 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 There's, it's a big tent. There's room for lots of things inside it. Well, hopefully it would probably strengthen stomachs too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Strengthen your immunity. Some of us, it's, right. you know, I wish I could, some foods, I they look beautiful. I wish I could eat them, but there are some cultures where the food just doesn't sit there very well. <laughs> Practice practice yeah well david well, you know I, was... I want it was yeah thank you i mean thank you so much you're and for being open and and sharing with me and talking about life and how you see it you know i don't know what movie you're you know whatever you're planning but perspective should be a theme because it seems to be something you think about a lot <laughs> yeah well thank you yeah i hope uh yeah i hope the story that i'm trying to tell is um has some universal appeal how's that and some well, universal truths in there somewhere well my husband and i hope to see you in more stuff so ah, me too we're looking forward to whatever you come out with okay well thank you so much time flew wow all right all right bye david thank you okay take care